So welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us uh, for this perfect week webinar sharing event. So this is all really all about the guys at South Warwickshire who um, and Rachel will give you a quick introduction uh, about the details that they uh, they, they ran um, a number of perfect weeks over uh, a few from months ago. This was an opportunity just to share. We're, we're as e sister we're, we're hosting for them. So quick run through of the agenda. Some of these have moved around, but just to give you an idea of what's, what's coming up. Rachel's going to cover off a bit of an introduction, then we're going to hear from um, a few speakers around TTO improvements. We all have a bit of TTO improvement, don't we? Uh, Frailty Virtual Ward, working with volunteers, and some of the great work that the team down there are doing with Warwickshire Fire and Rescue. Uh, just a few uh, tips for the, for the session. Please go on mute if you haven't already, apart from the speakers. That'll be great. Uh, we will have a, a Q&A with a panel at the end, so any questions you've got throughout the, the session, we won't be stopping between speakers for a Q&A, we'll, we'll do a panel discussion at the end, so please put any questions in the chat box and I'll pull those together for the panel at the end, but you'll also be available to, um, to answer any questions directly to the panel if, if you want. Also add any comments, that I'm sure the team would also love to see any feedback, any observations, that'd be really helpful as well. It's always great when you come into a presentation. Uh, it's always nice to have a bit of feedback as well if you've got any comments on the word that's been presented. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Rachel to kick things off uh, and we'll hear some of the great stories we've been doing over at South Warwickshire. Rachel, over to you. Hi, thank you very much, Nick, and thank you everybody for taking the time to, um, to join us and allow us to share the good work that the teams have been doing. So we just to preamble really about what we did for Perfect Week, we didn't run the Perfect Week and highly resource everything. What we did is we just used our resources differently here in South Warwickshire. And what we've also tried to do is anything we put in make sustainable um, so it could just continue happening and become business as usual and to see those improvements go. Um, we started our first perfect week in January and then had another one in March and now we're planning another one um, on Monday and Tuesday around effective communication. So each time we're doing something, we're trying things differently and we're measuring that as well. So our measures have been around TTO time, times of discharge, number of discharges in the day and at weekends and looking at our 721 um, day length of stay for our patients. We also have seen about times of communication with the wards and whether that's releasing nursing time back and looking at deconditioning. So we've looked at a lot of the key metrics that are out there for us to see whether what we're doing is right and how sustainable it is. So really that's very much a very quick preamble. I'm not going to take much time up because the speakers have got some fantastic presentations. We're going to start off with Sarah from Warwickshire Fire and Rescue because unfortunately she can only stay for her presentation, but I'm happy to pick up the Q&A if people have got that um, from Sarah. So I'm handing over to Sarah um, in Warwickshire Fire and Rescue. Hello and thank you ever so much for inviting me today. I am actually um, on call for Hospital to Home, in fact, today, the very presentation that I'm talking about. So if I can just share my screen um, with you, I'm hoping that you'll be able to see it. Are you able to see that screen now? We are having some IT issues today. We we'll just see you, Sarah. We'll just see me, right, bear with me. Let's go into here. Right, are you able yeah. to see my presentation? Perfect. We've got Lovely. <laughs> right, sorry, we are having a few IT glitches today and it is taking its time. So, yep, so my name's Sarah Shepherd. I'm um, a community fire safety officer for Warwickshire Fire and Rescue Service. Um, I also do participate in the hospital to home service and I am on call today. So if I just give you a little bit of an update about who we are. So we've got four dedicated hospital to home team members. We're based at Bedworth Fire Station. We've got additional team members working within the fire service who, um, sorry, I'm not sure why it's jumping ahead, um, who support us during the evenings and weekends. And our hours of work are between 10 in the morning and 10 in the evening. That's 365 days a year. So you can call on us on bank holidays, uh, weekends, whenever. So the hospitals that we currently cover that use our service are Warwick Hospital, University Coventry and Warwick Hospital, George Elliott Hospital and during the COVID-19 pandemic we also gave support to Ellen Badger 
at Shipston upon Stour, the Nickel Unit at Stratford Hospital, and Felden Ward at Leamington Hospital. So we were kept quite busy. So when we're looking at criteria for hospital to home, we just need to know that the patient's ready for discharge. At this point, please do note that we don't collect from red wards. So our general criteria is people over 55, that's a reduction from 65 due to the pandemic. But if there is somebody who is vulnerable, who is under 55, have a chat with our control room. We'll see what we can do to help. The patient needs to have a Warwickshire postcode and they need to have no one who can collect them from hospital. So if they haven't got any friends, family, we can come and get them. We need them to be able to walk a short distance with or without a walking aid. So, for example, once we pull up at their, their house or flat that, you know, they could walk to the front door um, or they can walk around the house just to get we can get them settled into their chairs and they need to be able to get in and out of a car with minimal assistance. We do ask that ward staff make sure that the following is available to us. So all the medications ready. The, if there's a respect form that we've got that hospital discharge letter, if that's applicable for the patient and a wheelchair to transport the patient from ward to car, if that's required as well. And also we do have a hand handover paperwork. It's about two pages long. Most of it's tick boxes just so that we've got a record of that handover as well. What I'd like to do now, and I'm hoping that this will work, so if it does start to lag or it's not working for you, please somebody give a shout out and I'll send a link um, to you to watch. But it, I think rather than me talking, this just gives a real flavour of what, um, what Hospital to Home is all about and why it's so important and valuable for our patients. If you don't mind my asking, how, how old are you? You guys. 25. Not quite. 96. But I fell down. And the next thing was I was in hospital. It's the fire brigade brought, brought me out. They pick some people up because they can't get an ambulance. They're very good. When you're in the environment that you're in, when you're in the hospital, you want that treatment. You want to know that the doctors and the consultants and all the, the healthcare staff are working with you but it's also giving you the empowerment then to, to get out of hospital, to have that confidence, to have that independence, to move on, to know that actually when you're discharged, that you're not going to be just sort of put on a doorstep and you're going to be left with nothing. And I think that's then where hospital home comes in. You know, we're checking, have you got carers? Do you feel okay at home? Is there anything else that you need? Because we can help put those things in place or ask the questions as to whether there are any additional needs that could be met. I didn't know anything about this. Um... Uh, fire service doing this. It sounds to me like an awfully good idea because the ambulances are stretched. Uh, the calls placed to our fire service control room on a dedicated line um, identified as the hospital that's calling. Uh, they go through a set criteria just to make sure that the, um, the service is suitable for the individual and then as soon as they're satisfied uh, they mobilise the next available team. One of the nurses came along later on and said um, you can go home now and you'll be taken home by the fire service and that Caught me out a bit, first of all, because I didn't know whether she really meant that or not. He came in a car. There were two people with him. They'd already got him in a wheelchair and were wheeling him across the, um, the car park. And uh, they offered to bring him all the way up and set things up up here. They were very nice people. Every person that we pick up has such a different story to tell us. And I think it's nice in terms of when we are running hospital to home, people aren't taken home sort of in twos and threes. It's that one-to-one -one service. So people will talk to us about their children, their families. But then we've also had cases where, you know, you can see that they need that extra support. And they've actually spent that time in the, the vehicle talking to you. We get them back and actually they're more open than to say, actually, could you help me? We get into the home and we do that hazard inspection. We're contacting care providers, family members. We're sort of identifying where the medication is. There's been occasions where we've put the heating on, turned the heating off, opened curtains, made a cup of tea, made a sandwich, um, taking a customer's dog out for a walk. It makes people smile when I say that because it's not something that you would have imagined when we first started this. We're building up a relationship almost instant with these people. They came back a different way to what I would have done. And say well, they come straight to Stratford. I wouldn't have done it. Still, that's their problem, isn't it? Eh? In some ways, it's better to be in hospital because there's people keeping an eye on all the time. But he's much happier here than he is in hospital. He'll look after himself, and home is obviously the best place for him. 
We'd like to see the service continued. It's, it's a funded service. Um, it's, com it's commissioned by Warwickshire County Council and um, w we think there's room for growth. I think we've got a lot of skills and potential to, to expand in terms of whether or not we can go out to, to other wards and maybe some longer term people um, who've maybe been in for a month or two. If you can't get patients home, you can't get patients in um, and that's on a routine basis. It's well documented that if you have a crowded A&E that the mortality of patients rise and that's because you can't get patients to the right place. The fire service taking them home within an hour is the absolute idea deal really for us to be able to be working with them. It's far better being home than in hospital. Better any time that is. So as you can see it makes such a, a big difference to the patients that we take home. So as was mentioned, um, following sort of return to home, we do what's called a safe and well check. Some of the things that we can provide um, within that safe and well check are obviously smoke detection within properties. And we also install what's called a hard of hearing alarm. So that's for people who are hard of hearing. If they take the hearing aids out at night, they wouldn't be able to hear those smoke detectors. It's a vibrating pad that goes under the pillow. It shakes to wake the person up. We'll also provide fire retardant equipment, including bedding, throws and self-extinguishing bins, especially for those people who smoke um, in bed or are bed bound. Just again, it doesn't eliminate risks, but it reduces risks. And we'll also pop night lights in for people if and when that's needed to. We'll provide support to residents living in homes that are cluttered or hoarded to ensure they've got an escape route in the event of an emergency. And again, once we get home, we may see that referrals to other agencies are needed and we'll make those referrals in to make sure that resident is safe within the home. We talk to them around um, how to manage cold calls, telephone scams, especially with COVID at the moment. There's so many scams going around. It's hard to know who to trust, what to believe. So we talk to people about those as well. And again, we've just recently started to do the timed up and go assessments and we'll make the referrals um, to the false prevention team as needed. So as you can see, it's it's more than just a, a sort of a, a take home. As I can say, thank you ever so much. I'm sorry we had a few um, problems at the beginning with the uh, technology, but our systems aren't working greatly at the moment. If you do have any questions, I'm sorry I have got to leave um, today, but um, you can always pop them across to us via email and I'll do my very best to answer them. But can I say a big thank you for uh, inviting me today? Thank you very much, Sarah. And I think every time we play that film, um, I get goosebumps, I will be honest, um, because it is just so much about how that patient felt and um, what is delivered from the service. So thank you very much. Um, see you later, no doubt, at the Warwick site um, collecting the patients. So uh, we're now going over to Anne Hutton, who is our head of pharmacy, to talk about TTO improvement. Anne, over to yourself. Thank you very much. Um, can everybody see my screen? Yes. Good. OK, so I'm going to talk to you. I'm the Deputy Head of Pharmacy and the Medication Safety Officer at Warwick Hospital. So I got the job really of um, overseeing TTO flow, especially the pharmacy response to perfect week. So uh, the first thing that we managed to improve was the TTO screening time. The first step once a TTO is written is that a clinical pharmacist needs to review that TTO and make sure it is all appropriate and all the correct medications are on it and resolve any discrepancies. Um, prior to Perfect Week, pharmacy only met the, their target screening time of one hour on 42% of occasions. And we have managed to now improve that to over 70% consistently, which is a massive improvement. So how did we manage to do this? Well, the first thing was to increase our pharmacy staff awareness of the target time, um, because actually it wasn't greatly known to everybody that we even had a target. So people were just sort of planning their own days planning their own workloads and not realising that there was a bigger picture out there. Um, but, you know, we had these discharge and flow issues to deal with in the hospital. There was also a need for a real cultural change amongst our pharmacists um, because their focus is very much on keeping patients safe. And to them, a patient waiting to go home is safe 
all the medicines are dispensed for them on the ward and their worry is more with new patients coming in and making sure we get critical doses to them so their culture has always been in the past reviewing new patients in the morning and doing TTOs in an afternoon which used to work in the days where nobody wrote TTOs until the afternoon but the whole point of perfect week was that we started that a lot earlier in the day and got flow moving so we had to put a lot of work into our teams to kind of change the perception that it was actually okay to do your TTOs as soon as they crop up and use your spare time later in the day to look at your new patients because we weren't necessarily doing more work we were just needing to get people to do the work in a different order. We have a TTO tracker in the pharmacy. I think a lot of pharmacies have these now, which just keeps track of where the work is and what stage of the operation the work is in. Um, and so we were monitoring this very closely. So instead of leaving our pharmacists to it, um, we actually had the in management corridors, had the tracker switched on all day, keeping an eye on the times and actually just sending reminders out to people mm. when we felt that, they possibly were getting close to the target time just to make sure they'd spotted the TTO, see whether they'd got any problems. Some people would get back to us and say that, well, I've got six to do at once, which obviously is not something that they could manage. And then we were able to mobilise maybe somebody else from a different team who hadn't got a load of TTOs building up and get them to go across and help the person with the with the workflow issues. And we managed to get our team all talking to each other and helping each other out and redirecting themselves from A to B by using the Microsoft Teams chat function on Microsoft Teams. We put everybody in a group called the Pharmacy Huddle. Um, and the chat now goes day in, day out with people put, asking questions of each other, telling each other where they're up to with their work, asking for help from each other, informing each other of things that they've heard about that will need doing. Um, so that has greatly um, improved our teamwork. We have also um, given TTO tracker access um, to the wards and the site office so that non-pharmacy staff have got visibility as to where their TTOs are in the system. This obviously reduces the number of phone calls to pharmacy whilst they're trying to dispense and it also improves the, um, the workflow and it reduces the number of incidents where you'd have a doctor say yeah yeah I've done those TTOs and the nurses assume it's with pharmacy but we haven't got the TTO. Um, and if the nurses can look and see where's the TTO on the tracker and it's not there, then they know we haven't got it. And then we go back and we discover the doctor has not pressed the right button on EPMA or something and not quite finished the TTO. And then we can resolve those problems. And we're resolving problems like that as they happen now, rather than at the end of the day when the TTO doesn't appear. We also looked at the way that we use the technology within the department with mobile phones, because we've got a few mobile phones for people to carry around in the department, but they were assigned to individuals. So we decided to repurpose these phones and issue them to teams of individuals. And the staff were put into teams, which we've done for some time, to cover different groups of ward. And somebody from that team had to carry that phone. So we've got about eight teams um, and each team is responsible for a group of wards. And those wards have been given the set phone number to ring, which should always be answered because someone should always be carrying it. We have had a couple of issues because some of our um, sort of more temporary buildings have got an interesting metal structure which actually affects the mobile phone signal but we've managed to work around that um, and we have found that this is a much more efficient way of contacting pharmacy about queries because they've just got one number they don't have to ask the question who's covering my ward today they just phone that number and whoever's been allocated to cover their wards should be at the end of the phone and if it's not them that can solve the problem they then use the Microsoft Teams system and the chat which I referred to earlier to contact the colleague that can. So nurses aren't wasting time being passed from pillar to post trying to find the right person to talk to. The other thing that we introduced was runners and porters. So um, during Perfect Week, the benefits of having like a runner to deliver TTOs the moment they were ready to the ward was explored uh, by utilising some army volunteers who had been sent to the trust to help us at the time because we were sort of in second wave COVID. And this was found to be a really significant step. It made a real difference. So we managed to put a case forward to get a regular TTO porter service, which we have now put in place to improve the flow. 
the other thing that we did was start to work with site office more as a pharmacy team. So we were given a list of definite and potential discharges, which was made available to pharmacy every day, which then allows the pharmacist to plan their workload uh, or have an idea of what to expect in their areas. We did find some discrepancies between the list that comes from site office and the TTOs that were being handed in for the pharmacy to do. Uh, but that's just given us uh, more work to do, really, moving forward, looking at the reasons why this is. And then we can prioritise or, or refine this system so that it can be used as a better prioritisation tool in the future so that we can actually send people to the people who are going home first and get the TTOs done in the right order. And then finally, but kind of this is really the beginning of the, of the process, but it's beyond pharmacy, really. Um, Rachel organised for there to be a parachute team, which was fundamentally prescribers who are made available just to support the writing of TTOs and discharge letters, um, allowing these things to be developed earlier in the day, closer to when the decision to discharge is made. So instead of um, the team doctor then continuing the ward rounds and getting round to the jobs, one of which is writing TTOs at the in the afternoon after they've been around all the patients. There is somebody available to start the TTOs. So this has greatly helped pharmacy workload because it's spread it out throughout the day rather than have that big glut of sort of two o'clock onwards TTOs. And obviously it's also improved patient experience um, with respect to the waiting times and the flow. So that's uh, the end of my presentation. So I'll now hand that back to Rachel. Thank you very much, Anne. And, and even today, uh, we have done something differently with looking at our TTO writer. So we have a doctor employed for a whole shift to go out and action what TTOs we need doing right at that point of that decision making. We had somebody shadow them yesterday to see what improvements we could make. And we were finding that desk space and computer space was an issue. So today we found a computer on wheels for them to be able to take round from ward to ward and um, to see if that helps improvement. And we're going to monitor that, that next week in our effective communication perfect week that we're running. I'd now like to introduce um, two of our doctors who run our frailty service. So Dr. John Blair and Dr. James Reed. Um, over to you guys. Thanks very much, Rachel. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Excellent. Just going to share my slides. Um, so hopefully you should be able to see the title slide there. So firstly, thank you very much for the opportunity to, pre to present. Um, my name is John Blair. I'm uh, one of the consultant geriatricians working at Warwick Hospital, and I'm joined by my colleague James Reed, uh, another of our consultant geriatricians. I'm going to give you, um, if I can move the slide on, um, I'm going to give you a brief explanation of uh, uh, our current frailty service at Warwick and then talk about how we're improving integration with our community teams as part of the perfect week. And then finally, we'll talk a little bit ha about how this has led to community based PDSA uh, and what we uh, think the future looks like. So hopefully my slides are moving along. If they're not, please let me know. Um, over the past six years, we've developed the service at Warwick using uh, a, PDSA, a PDSA methodology with close support from uh, both management and the executive teams. Uh, and this has um, been helpful in fueling an expansion of our workforce and uh, our services. Um, the current frailty footprint uh, looks like this. We have a seven bedded frailty assessment area um, with uh, two acute frailty wards, so 35 beds in total. Um, we have a standardised approach to frailty across our inpatient ward base, which consists of the um, same culture. We use board rounds across our ward areas um, and uh, we have uh, standardised ways of MDT working, uh, similar tools and paperwork. Um, we use uh, a system called Consultant Connect and have a dedicated frailty phone to provide open access uh, and uh, easy communication with the frailty team for uh, those both in the hospital and outside. Uh, and we also use our uh, 
uh, frailty assessment area to allow direct admissions from a variety of different practitioners, gen, gen, uh, GPs, uh, the ambulance service, the West Midlands Ambulance Service uh, and uh, other community practitioners. Uh, we used our frailty assessment area for rapid access hot um, or hot uh, clinics uh, so uh, we can um, uh, if a patient is in crisis we can provide a comprehensive geriatric assessment that might be same day or maybe delayed slightly uh, we've also used it to provide dedicated same day emergency care slots uh, for other parts of, of the, the hospital such as a and e and 111 and we're also now starting to run multidisciplinary clinics through our frailty assessment area which allows uh, ease of access to the MDT and allows us to reduce some of our outpatient work. Um, so traditionally the approach to crisis in older people, people living with frailty is reactive um, and we're all well aware of the need to move away from this to a more proactive approach um, with uh, early warning of deterioration, timely intervention and robust advanced care planning. Um, these, these are all our patients, so we need to be involved in supporting them, whether or not they're in the hospital um, or the community. Uh, and we, we recognise that many of our older patients arrive in secondary care after a period of decline at home. And once they're admitted here, they're more likely to suffer hospital acquired function decline, complications, um, they're discharging them is difficult uh, and when they they're more likely to die and often unfortunately when they go home they're more dependent and have higher care needs which has an impact on both the patient uh, and the hospital and our community services so we proposed uh, we we propose a proportion of our patients will be better better managed at home with early intervention and effective transfer to secondary care if needed um, and this is where we felt uh, we uh, might be able to work closer with uh, with our community colleagues. We are an integrated trust. Um, we have a large team of clinical practitioners with ACP leads, community beds across three community hospital sites uh, and a, a clear point of communication with these teams. Um, obviously, you've listed some challenges down there uh, to working uh, uh, more closely. Um, but the idea of the perfect week was to uh, find a way of integrating uh, with our community colleagues uh, in, a, in a, a more efficient way. And I'm going to hand over to Dr. Reid uh, to, to describe further. So as, uh, thank you very much. As John mentioned, so clear things on our radar which we need to improve um, are essentially um, intervening early when people are declining in the community. What we really want to do is try and intervene uh, at the earliest point we can, ideally at home, so we can keep people at home and avoid any sort of transport to secondary care. We're very keen on developing uh, support and educational structures to support the people out in the community, uh, sharing skills and just uh, sharing, uh, you know, education, works, uh, workforce and developing as a single team. Um, we're also very interested in linking to all the other aspects of teams that are working currently in the community uh, through the GP practices and through all other avenues and just trying to produce a single uh, seamless service so we can uh, give the best uh, possible outcomes for the patients. So it's part of the perfect week and also around uh, other work we've been doing. Um, one of the first things we've done recently is develop a virtual uh, ward with a virtual MDT. So for the first time we linked up with our clinical practitioners. Uh, we have a virtual MDT every morning at nine o'clock where we sit down. Uh, we discuss all the cases from the previous day. We discuss cases people are interested in. Uh, we also use it as a jumping off point for any education around cases which may be of interest. Um, we will allocate home visits uh, to various practitioners who will then feed back and ask for advice as necessary. We use it as a point so we've got people in the community who are managing in the community who may need uh, elective investigations so we can sort out elective slots for them to come in to the frailty assessment area, have what investigation they need and then ideally go home again. Uh, we also have, um, so we have a virtual ward bed base so we can, any patients that we're going to uh, need to discuss on multiple days, we will put onto the virtual ward which is on our Lorenzo system uh, and then we'll discuss them uh, over the next few days uh, and to the point of discharge which is usually within about seven days. Um, for the virtual ward there's very close uh, consultant support and supervision so there's a consultant available to provide advice eight to eight, five days a week uh, and it's very easy to readily access the consultants. The other thing we've been providing as well is uh, registrar and consultant visits alongside the clinical practitioners just to provide that extra little bit of uh, expertise or support in the home environment. So, so far the, the virtual ward's been working very well. The clinical practitioners like it. Uh, it's got good feedback from them. They feel uh, supported. Uh, 
they're enjoying the educational opportunities and the ability to develop their skills further. Um, from our perspective, they provide good eyes and ears in the community. They give it a good uh, heads up when uh, somebody's deteriorating and it gives that opportunity really to intervene as early as possible. Um, and the virtual wards provided a good foundation for a subsequent PDSA, which we're currently doing, which I'll go on and discuss shortly. Are we OK for time, Rachel? Yeah, carry on. OK, good. So alongside the virtual ward, we've, uh, we wanted to try and identify the group of patients uh, as early as possible um, in the community. And we felt that from experience, uh, the ambulance service is our main uh, port, of, port for which most of our patients come through. So that's the sort of the, the key bottleneck in, in the service in which if we want to intervene and keep people at home, it's going to have to be through the ambulance service until we can uh, identify more effective means in the future. So we, we start off with a tabletop service, uh, tabletop uh, um, audit to identify, you know, where we could potentially intervene. So for eight days, we looked at all the over 80s uh, being conveyed into the trust. And we identified that on average over the eight days, there were about 48 calls a day to the ambulance service. 70% of those were between eight and eight. Um, majority came 999 direct uh, with the rest predominantly through 111 and then through an ambulance. Uh, we had about three to four calls from residential and nursing home with patients being conveyed uh, per day. So on the average, when we looked at all the, the calls we'd had, of the 48 calls, 26 of those would be conveyed on average and 21 be, would be non-conveyed. When we looked at the conveyed patients out of those 26, probably about 11, 11 or 41 percent could be converted to an alternative uh, means of uh, non-conveyance, such as a clinical practitioner visit, elective hot clinic slots, or referral to other services such as OT or community physiotherapy. So 11 out of the 26 could be kept at home by other means, which would equate to probably about 2,920 patients being non-conveyed who would otherwise be conveyed. Um, and then the other aspect to think about was the non-conveyed patients, which is an aspect which we are very interested in looking to in the future who theoretically the people that the ambulance service are seeing at home who are not being conveyed could potentially be our future target patients who are much earlier in their uh, deterioration than the patients who are being conveyed so that's an area which we're going to come back and review at a later date so this is currently what we're doing at the moment it's been uh, overlaid with the perfect week uh, we have the strategic cell um, in dudley who have all their ambulances out with patients over 80 in uh, south warwickshire um, and the idea is that they when they flag up a patient they're going to convey they then pick up the phone and speak to us and we discuss different options whether they we send out a clinical practitioner straight away within two hours or whether we think they need to come directly to the frailty assessment area or whether we can sort out an alternative such as a hot clinic slot so that's what's uh, currently in practice and what we found that in uh, uh, in complement complementary to the tabletop service we're finding that probably a 50 percent of the people being run through uh, 50 percent we can actually uh, convert from a a potential conveyance into a non-conveyance and that's quite consistent and when we also still look at the people that are being non-conveyed uh, that are being conveyed uh, who were not run through then the same sort of rates 56 percent probably could be converted into an alternative uh, means of managing them uh, future plans for the pdsa is to have a look at the non-conveyed patients i think that's probably where the biggest opportunity lies in terms of intervening really early in their journey and that's something we're interested in looking at uh, and then also integrating a little bit better with the strategic cell to try and allocate calls at the point of source. So maybe ambulances don't need to go out and see these people. We could uh, allocate them to clinical practitioners or other community teams and avoid ambulance call out at all. Um, and then this is just a last slide just to demonstrate our future state. But essentially it demonstrates the fact that uh, patient care should, well, we feel should be really focused around where they live where we uh, provide the expertise and support across the whole organization and the system to really deliver you know, expertise of whatever's required at the patient's home with a seamless transition to an actual secondary care facility if needed, and then a seamless transition out to avoid uh, people spending uh, minimum time in hospital and spending as much time at home with whatever support they need. Uh, so that we're actually planning the journey rather than just bouncing into a crisis. Um, and that's, that's my last slide, thank you. Thank you very much, James and John. Um, as you can see, we always try and do something different here at South Warwickshire, and I've got plans to keep changing um, and do the best for our patients. So I'm sure you guys are going to get loads of questions at the end in the Q&A panel. So I'll just move over now to Julie. Julie is one of our 
two people who help coordinate the volunteers that we use here in South Warwickshire for multiple uh, reasons. Um, and Julie's going to talk us through that. So hello, Julie, and thank you. Hello, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Can you see my screen, Rachel? Yes, you're up and running, Julie. Lovely, thank you very much. OK, so I've been asked just to talk about volunteer use. Um, and first of all, I'd just like to say a little bit about who we are. Um, we're Warwickshire 4x4 volunteers. We've been set up for about three years now. Um, and primarily, the reason that we are, exist is to transport hospital staff in adverse weather. So really, we are only called upon normally um, in the winter when we need to get staff in and out of hospital for their, uh, their shifts. We have over, uh, over 200 volunteers um, and this winter at one point we did have more than 65 cars out in one night. So um, quite a, um, an impressive routine. The COVID pandemic then comes along and it means that we as a group of volunteers diversify. And we started out by doing PPE deliveries from Warwick to all the outlying hospitals within the South Warwickshire Foundation Trust. We were also delivering donations that were, were given to the hospital. And then we became involved in doing the perfect week. For the perfect week, we were asked if um, our members would be happy to take out equipment to people so that the hospital could discharge a patient and we would then deliver to them things like Zimmer frames or it could be medication that wasn't ready when the patient was ready to go home um, and, and things like that. In fact, anything that they needed to get to the patient so that they could go home early or at that time. We've also been involved in taking um, bereaved patients' belongings. During the lockdowns, we were taking bereaved patients' belongings back to their loved ones um, and, and looking after that for the hospital. We do patient activities for the Swift charity, um, but we've also been working very closely now with the frailty virtual ward, and this really has all come out of the perfect week work. So the current task that we do we have um, all of the community clinical practitioners have our phone numbers. The calls from the community practitioners will come through to me. They may be with a patient and they've just taken bloods from that patient. Um, they will contact me. I will get one of our volunteers to go out to the patient's home, pick up those bloods and then take them into the ho hospital so that they can be turned around quickly and the person can get whatever medication is required to them as quickly as possible. We also then will probably get a call to actually pick up that prescription, get the meds fulfilled and take them back to the patient. So we're doing those things most of the time. Again, things that came out of the perfect week was swab delivery. We do twice weekly swab delivery between the Ellen Badger Hospital back to Warwick Hospital to get those to them um, when they're required. The next thing we're looking at, again, really coming out of the uh, perfect week is furniture moving. And we have a number of volunteers who are more than happy to do this and are currently going through hospital training to make sure that they are fully trained to be able to do this. But this is to enable patients to go home from the hospital as early as possible. Some of them need to have their beds moved from upstairs to downstairs to make their move possible. And we are looking at being a group of people that can go out and do that furniture removal on behalf of the hospital so that the patient can go back home. We know social services will do this, but it can sometimes take them two to three weeks to arrange it. We have a team of people who will probably respond within 48 hours to getting that happening. Um, so I think basically that's where we are involved and what we are doing. We are purely a volunteer based group um, nobody gets paid anything for doing any of these things. It's just our way of giving our little bit back into the community. Thank you. I think that's me. Thank you, Julie. And I think the one thing that you've missed that I think is a really lovely touch that's worth sharing is when you take out those bereaved family 
um, belongings back to the family that you take a bunch of flowers and you spend time with that family as well. So I think that's a that's a real heartfelt touch that you as volunteers have, have chosen to do um, off your back. So um, thank you very much. Um, we can't say thank you enough for um, how you're supporting us and how you're helping improve our patient turnaround time. So I know that we've probably got a few minutes extra and what we'd like to squeeze in is a presentation um, from Jenny Nichols about effective communication because we felt that that was really key and what we learned out of the perfect week as well. So over to Jenny. Thanks. Can you um, see my screen? We can. OK, thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, as Rachel said, my name is Jen Nichols. Um, so I'm Emergency Flow Program Manager. So uh, as of all the presentations today that you've seen, um, I think it's really evident how important communication is. And um, Perfect Week has given us the opportunity to look at enhancing communication. So this is just a, a few add-ons to what has already been discussed about the, the way we, we communicated and um, how work was going on in that one week. So, um, first of all, we utilised the Teams calls, which are already in situ at the um, beginning of the day, midday and in the afternoon, just to talk about um, what the plans were for that day or what happened yesterday. Um, we regrouped at midday to understand if those plans that we discussed um, earlier on, they're still in situ, what needs to change, what's working well, what do we need to do instead? And then at the end of the day, we, we regrouped to, again, talk about what was going on. So everybody now is, is used to Teams and, and that also allowed us the opportunity to keep create um, a team site specifically for the perfect week. So beauty of Teams, it's available anytime. Um, um, through most uh, platforms. So whether it's a laptop, it's on an iPad or a phone, it gives them um, everybody that opportunity to provide updates and requests. And during that perfect week, you could see in the chat there is information about particular bloods being ready or a patient ready for discharge, different things which everybody could see. But also, I think what worked really well were the motivational words and and the thanks and and you know look what we've done now and this has just happened and I think jeering everybody up, knowing that actually all this work which we're doing as part of a perfect week as with any other time, that actually look at these outputs from this. So so having that platform again to to say thank you and those motivational um, uh, words um, really added weight as well. Um, what we introduced as well was having iPads on the wards. So Computers on Wheels um, is, is great and it's out there, but it's so busy with the doctors and, and anybody else who needs to access the information. Um, what sometimes it doesn't allow us is to have that um, real time updating of a platform that we use called Digit which is a method of communication really between the wards and site capacity. Um, however, information which is reliant on people inputting it is only as good as the information and the time that information is added. So by providing iPads and the wards, um, it encouraged that um, real time information and that was an alternative message uh, method of contact um, rather than using calls and telephone so site felt that they didn't have to ring the wards as much and the wards weren't ringing site as much because they were optimizing the digit software by using the iPads and the final thing that we really pushed um, to promote was Consultant Connect. Now, during the very first perfect week, we promoted Consultant Connect as a dialer. So it's a service which allows professional to professional to have those recorded telephone conversations um, and where um, the personal telephone numbers are not shared. It's all through a platform and, and one number is given out. And then basically you choose an option to get through to that right team. However, in the second perfect week, what we really tried to push was the app. And with the app, it just allows you to scroll down um, then press the service or the team or the um, consultant that you wanted to speak to um, and have that conversation, which is recorded. 
and then it allows you then to provide an outcome so an outcome would be you know has there been an admission avoidance um do we need to um convey that that patient different outcomes and this is something as well which um we're working with the frailty pds on as well to pdsa with just to understand the outcomes of all those telephone calls that they're receiving from the ambulance crews so consultant connect it, it also shows you how many calls have been made or what time of those calls are so you can start to understand um, capacity and demand so that again is something that um is is working in the trust and seems to be a very uh, safe way and uh, an effective way of using professional to professional communication um and that's it from me because i know next week we're really enhancing that communication again with with what rachel has already said about the perfect week for next week Thank you very much, um, Jenny, for sharing that. I'm going to hand you back to Nick now. Nick, you're going to take over from me. Thank you, Rachel. That was that's been great. I mean, those some of those presentations really on on the mark, really um, really clear. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, all the presenters, for for sharing your work. <clears throat> A couple of questions from the chat, but I'm going to take chair privilege for 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 the start the start of one. So, Rachel, it's to you really, as um, you and um, uh, you and Jenny really it's as we know we perfect weeks a lot of it a lot of the success is in the planning and the preparation so we've just heard there about some really great communication take us back a few steps and and talk us through some of the top tips that you would share with with the with the rest here about how you prepare for the perfect week and what kind of uh, communication do you need to do to get this right okay so I think really it, it wasn't managerial driven so we knew that we were bottlenecking in ED, we knew that our attendances were going up, we knew that there was more pressure on the wards, not only with COVID as, as well as the normal attendances. So we called a meeting together with our clinicians, our associate medical directors and our CDs for each specialty to say we're struggling, what can we do, what will help you, um, tell us. And I would say the best thing is listen to your clinical teams. Um, I'd like to think that our clinical teams who are on here will say they tend to give me an idea and I'll go, how quick can we do it? Um, and then we planned. So our first perfect week was planned in three days. We had an hours meeting um, each day with all the key players. So all the clinicians were on the call. There were senior nurses on the call. There were managers on the call. And we literally did a task and finish group. So it was, are we going to have a runner for TTOs? That's an idea today, tomorrow, and have we got the runner for TTOs? Yes. Are we going to have a parachute team for, for phlebotomy? Who's providing it? The next day it was yes. So all the ideas were built up. We put it in a little table. We said yes or no when it was going to start. And then on the first day of Perfect Week launch, we used our comms team a lot to do a lot of screen savers and advertise stuff. But then we took round the table of everything that was going to be active of that day and how you could access it on day one of the perfect week of our first perfect week. Then we've just grown that as it's gone along. Mm, yeah, brilliant. No, that's, that's uh, as to be fair, I saw your Twitter activity as well. I was, well, I was, I was trying to keep up with your Twitter activity, to be fair, and it was it was quite extensive. So all those different routes are really, really powerful. A couple of questions. I think one was picked up on in the uh, in the chat anyway, but this was for uh, Anne, I think it would be. So the question was from Jane, Jane Reed. Uh, did you also engage with the medical staff to start writing TTOs earlier in the day? And how successful were you in this? But so, so just around the TTO work, the, whether to you, Rachel, or to Anne, uh, how do we engage with the, with the medical teams to start the process a little bit earlier? So, so if I if I answer the, the TTO writer was actually brought up as an idea from the from the medical teams, um, so they they all said we need discharges earlier in the day. Our board and ward rounds, we want to see our sick patients. Um, we've got limited resource. What would really be helpful if you could take the jobs off us that actually are going to do, do be done at the end of the day. So could we trial a doctor who will go out there, go around the wards and just write TTOs for us, which is what we did. But we also picked up on the fact that we know that phlebotomy teams start at seven o'clock in the morning. Actually, it, you have to have your blood form written the night before, but we know new admissions can go to the ward. Once you've done a board round, the patient's condition can change. You suddenly need those urgent bloods. So what they did also say was, can we have a floating phlebotomist? 
who once we've done board rounds, if the phlebotomy round has happened at seven, they never go back again. It's another job for the doctors to do. So we placed another team in to be able to go back once board rounds have been done to mop up the bloods when the phlebotomy team had been on there. Again, that's another idea from the clinicians that came forward. No, brilliant. That's really great. Thanks for that. Uh, so another question from from Nisha, Nisha Dutton Plummer, uh, to, uh, to would have been to Julie. So comment was great volunteer team. Uh, do the volunteers have particular insurance for themselves or their cars? So that's to Julie if she's still on the call. To me, yes, yes, and still here. Um, the only thing that we have found is that you need to notify your insurance company that you are doing a volunteer role for the NHS and nobody has ever been charged anything for it. They make a note on it that you're doing that, but we have never had anyone had to pay any more on their insurance because of it. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you, Julie, for that. OK, so those are all the questions from the chat. So anybody in the room, pop your hand up and I'll come to you. Anybody got any questions for Rachel and the speakers? Uh, anybody else, any other queries you've got, just pop your hand up now. That, uh, yeah. Rachel, that uh, we got some of the information for the delays from our criteria to reside dashboard as well, which was being used by our clinicians. Thank you. Those. Yeah, the TTOs and all they came up in that as well. Mm. So, Jyoti, I mean, as a as a clinician, there, uh, how how were you involved in the perfect week, and, and how did you uh, you you put a few, few comments in the chat as well? Do you want to just yeah. elaborate on that a little bit more? Well, Rachel is brilliant at, at organising these meetings, <laughs> and uh, as I said, three days it was. I think a little bit more than perhaps, but the teams really helped. In the past, we would normally have to have meeting rooms for you know people to, uh, places to meet and then decide you know where, where and travel to the room. The teams really helped because wherever the clinicians were they could just uh, come in and uh, you know lunch times was brilliant and the medical input was great wasn't it Rachel everyone joined in although they were really busy all the clinicians were busy but everyone joined in and uh, they were just giving ideas like nobody's business wasn't when they so everyone was uh, jumping in saying this you, we could do this we could do this and the people were taking it you know pharmacy and i don't know if she's still on the call they were just listening and saying oh let, let, let us do this then you know they were coming up with ideas themselves pharmacy you know um what the volunteer drivers lots of people they were just offering themselves up with solutions mm. that's brilliant so it is all about that momentum isn't it as you as you carry on and that what, what i heard before was that kind of ask an offer as well so if you do this we'll do this so that's that's always really helpful uh tim gonna come to you yeah, I just wanted to come in. So, those I mean, I'm Tim Jillis. I work work for eSystem. We've been involved in a lot of perfect weeks um, around and about. And I suppose it's a it's a comment and a question really around the the speed with which you managed to get the um, to get this going because it sounds very exciting. Three days, you know, to 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 stand something up. I, I suppose I would just push back a little bit and and say that's probably helped by the the culture of improvement and the can do attitude and perhaps experience of doing this kind of work before. So for the, the maybe systems represented on the call, and I know I'm working with a couple at the moment who are planning perfect weeks, and we're saying actually you probably need six weeks to be honest to go from never having done this to get something that's that's actually got some structure, you know, where you can do the rapid PDSA, you're collecting the right data, you've got the right people, the right people involved, um, so that it does perhaps in the, if if it's your first one, it needs a little bit more time than 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 perhaps you've needed uh, given your experience. Yes. Is, is is that a fair comment, Rachel and Jyoti, or would you or would you would you yeah, agree no, with that? Yeah, no, Tim. I think I think we're very lucky here at Sad Warwickshire. We've got a very um, service improvement mentality, and that's from Glendown. Um, and also, we we don't tend to go through lots of paper writing, project writing. Um, we're very much the let's try it. If it's harmful, stop it immediately. If, it, if it's the right thing to do, let's carry on. And I think John and James have sort of displayed as well. The clinicians are so bought in and you, like Josie said, you give them a forum to say, what can you do? How can we do things differently? And you are inundated with ideas. What we're doing going forward is we're going to start a perfect week mailbox um, and we're going to throw that out as well. So in our improved communication week next week, so we held a meeting yesterday about streaming we wanted to run a streaming um, perfect week next week. 
the clinical team said, actually, I think we need a little bit more time. It was listening to them. And we said, what we can do, right, let's make sure we get the right patient to the right place at the right time. And that's what we're going to try and do next week by just improved communication. We had that meeting. It finished at uh, quarter past five yesterday. It did run over because people have got so many ideas. Already this morning, if I tell you, a whiteboard has been set up for the SDEC area in Obs and Gynae for us to be able to visualise what patients are in there because the site team were able to see it before. And that is just the speed that everybody is working at here. I, I'm very lucky. I work with amazing people. I think if I can just add to that, Tim, you're quite right. I think pharmacy would have been thrown into a state of chaos um, had it not been that um, completely by chance we were already working with the service improvement team. And so we'd had all these ideas lined up um, and have been pontificating for probably three to six months um, on actually putting some of them in place. And this was just the impetus we needed to go, well, we were thinking of um, and, you know, just went ahead. So we were lucky, really, that we're, we've got that culture in the trust. So we were already sort of there. It just needed a, a, a forum, really, to jump in and just make those changes. So, yes, you know, I think you do have to be realistic about what you'd expect other people to be able to do. Yeah, I think that's I think that's a really interesting point, Anne, isn't it? And I suppose the other thing I pick up from all your responses there is there's something about the scope of this, isn't there, as well? You can do a perfect week that is a whole system. We're just going to do a no delays or what if everybody said yes kind of approach. But actually, there's something early doors about, about getting that scope nailed. So that scope could be we're just going to do it in medicine or we're just going to do it on our elective pathways. Or it could be that we're just going to focus on one of our support services and, and looking at improvement there or an issue across the organisation like communication. So there's something there about about really, really articulating the scope and agreeing that early, isn't there, in the in, in the process? And, and arguably, if it is just one area or one issue, you might be able to do that quicker. But a traditional whole system perfect week probably does need that bit more planning if it's your first one. Hmm. We get Thank accused you. of uh, saying, you know, we're always doing PDSAs. We get accused, but that's continuous quality improvement, isn't it? You're doing continuously <laughs> developing something. <laughs> yeah, you're absolutely right. So th thanks, thanks, Dan. Thank you, Anne. We're just coming towards the end of time. One, one last. Is anybody else getting any questions? Please, please put your hand up. But one last question for me, uh, to Rachel and to Jyoti. Uh, having done these and you've got the experience of doing these, as Tim was alluding to, and I know you're planning more. What have you learned? What have you, what have you learned from the previous ones that you thought? maybe that that didn't work quite well and we, we need to do something different for next time and uh, as you're getting really expertise in this you know it's really is getting down to that that's uh that fine fine tuning what's one of those fine tuned moments that you think you picked up on for me one of them is around the consultant connect app that um jenny spoke about so we got it set up. We didn't particularly advertise it very well. We launched it perfect week one and we were like, mm, we're a bit disappointed in this. It actually hasn't had the uptake, but then it didn't have somebody assigned to it. So we tried it in perfect week two. We're going to try it again now in perfect week with improved communication. And I think it's one, if it's the right thing to do, never give up and be a bit like a dog with a bone with it. But also use your skills as a manager to understand that different forums need different ways of selling something and don't sell it one way you've got to sort of attack it at various different angles and if you've got champions so for instance john blair is a great champion for the app and john i don't know whether you want to come in and say how how useful you found it but actually use your clinicians like that to be able to sell it to others yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm going to. I'm conscious of time, so, so John, John, and James, I'm going to cut across you, but I, we've we've just come up to time. But I'm sure you'll be open to lots of questions from lots of people, and I'm sure there'll be lots of interest. Uh, this recording will be available on our YouTube channel. And we'll put it out, so if anybody missed it, they can pick it up. But great piece of work, Rachel. Absolutely great piece of work, and thank you to everybody who's presented. You did some really, really great work, uh, and thanks for sharing it today on this webinar. Uh, and I'm sure you'll. We can share your details as well. I'm sure if anybody wants to get in touch, but thank you again. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye.